Good morning, party people, and welcome to Telluride, Colorado, out here on vacation uh, with Beanie and Eve. Hey, Beanie, come on up. You want to say hi to party people? Oh, up here on vacation with uh, uh, Beanie and Eve, uh, getting away from the Las Vegas heat. Uh, beautiful weather out here in Colorado. So. Uh, out here for several days and figured, hey, sure, why don't I go pop on uh, the camera and go record some of your questions from uh, your poll gap. So let's hit the top rated question. Top rated question is from Ozan who asks, hi Brent, oh, I gotta hit the show button, there we go. Hi Brent, how should VSS backups be configured so that they won't freeze the database's IO for seconds or minutes? Well, you really don't get a whole lot of configurations on the SQL Server side. All the configuration is done on the storage side, whether you're using NetApp, Amazon, Azure, whatever it is that you're using for storage, that's the side where you have to configure it. And unfortunately, I can't give you answers for every storage vendor inside the span of 30 seconds. The one thing that I would tell you is make sure that you're freezing less than 30 databases at a time. SQL Server freezes the databases serially, one at a time, in order. Uh, so if you have more than about 30 databases, you'll end up with uh, terrible slowdowns. Um, it, the SAN snapshot VSS backups are really for uh, large databases and relatively few of them. That's the place where it really makes the most sense. Next up, let's see here, Miles asks, Hi Brent, as a database administrator, how do you track your work? Do you use any tool or Excel? Hold on a second, I, it didn't grab my click quite correctly. Now let's try that again. So let's click it, there we go. Miles asks, hi Brent, as a database administrator, how do you track your work? Do you use any tool or Excel? Because my manager asked me to send the list of items worked over the last 10 months, for example. Oh, for me, it's really simple. I would just only work off of help desk tickets. Whether you're working with GitHub issues or Jira or some kind of help desk software, I would only do work based off of help desk tickets. So if someone asked me to do work, I'd say, sure, put it in an issue, and then that way I can prioritize it with the rest, and I'll start working on it as soon as I get the issue. If I was dealing with staff, who didn't like putting in issues, I would put the issues in myself so that that way I could at least still track uh, what it was that they were asking for and I could go back and run reports and see which of my users had been the most uh, needy, for example. Next up, Yulka asks, uh, what are the top issues that you see with using file stream in SQL Server? Far and away, it's just plain old backup and restore. Backup and restore takes longer. The more stuff that you put in the database, don't store files in the database, put them in something called a file system instead. Logar the Barbarian asks, what kinds of problems have you dealt with and resolved for clients using Dynamics GP? Performance. Honestly, everybody calls me for performance issues. I'm not saying that Dynamics GP performs poorly. That's actually not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that I happen to specialize in performance issues, slow performance, slow queries. You, you can't say, you know, what's the problem? Is it a slow app queries or is it uh, insufficient hardware or bad configuration settings? There are lots of different ways that you can work around these problems. Sometimes it's tuning queries, uh, like especially if it's third-party queries that somebody's built something on top of Dynamics GP. True story, once somebody came in complaining that Dynamics GP was terribly slow and we popped the hood and it was the database administrator's own homegrown monitoring tool. They built their own monitoring tool that was doing all kinds of over-the-top uh, queries continuously. And I just said, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you turn that off for 15 minutes and let's go see how performance is? And all of a sudden, the business was ecstatic. And I said, well, see, this is why you don't write your own monitoring tools if you're not in the monitoring tools business. Next up, Pavle asks, is it okay to update to the latest SQL CU when you're four updates behind, or should you install the CUs one at a time? The C in CU stands for cumulative. 
So the latest cumulative update has all of the updates that had been up to this point. That's why they're called cumulative updates. So you only have to install the last one. Rotne asks, do you have any suggestions for dealing with Azure alert fatigue? Putting in email rules or folders seems potentially heavy handed. Yes, change the thresholds on your alerts. If you're getting alerted for things that you can't take action on or things that you don't care about, change your thresholds. Go in and reconfigure those alerts so that you're not getting alerted for things that you can't take action on. I would give that same advice for any monitoring software. Malaga asks, what is your opinion of performing Azure SQL VM backups using crash consistent snapshots? I don't like it. If you go to YouTube and you search for Brent Ozar Senior DBA class, Brent Ozar Senior DBA class, I have a whole playlist on YouTube that goes through uh, a lot of classes for senior DBAs, as you might guess by the name. One of those is about snapshot backups. And in that one, I talk about the differences between crash consistent backups and good snapshot backups. I explain the pros and cons of those and explain why you don't want to be using crash consistent ones. Miles asks, hi Brent, my dev team is trying to delete a log table based on a correlated subquery. Um, it's not performing well. Uh, it took more than an hour when we tried to kill it. Is there any advice to make deletes faster? Yes. Search for Brent Ozar, how to delete data from a very large table. There are some days when I feel like I've blogged about everything under the sun. And I suppose to some extent, when you're going to ask me a question, you should probably Google that question and put my name in because I have been blogging for like 20 years now, more than 20 years. My blog is old enough to drink, which makes me drink. But I've actually written about a, a technique called fast order deletes that helps you accomplish that exact thing uh, by deleting through the table in small chunks and avoiding lock escalation. Hordis asks, when should you put new tables in a file group other than primary I'm going to give you a simplified answer of one scenario that I see is the most common. There are other scenarios. I'm just going to give you the one that I see the most often, which is more than a terabyte worth of data in one database. And your some of that data is archive. We're not allowed to move it out of the database. It has to be inside the same database, but some of it is just old archive junk. I'll put that in a separate file group so that I can restore the primary file group right away and then take my time restoring other file groups. In the last 10 years, I think I can count on one hand the number of times that I've seen someone actually do that, actually restore just the primary file group separately. It's not a common technique. It's a really rare and unusual technique. Also, putting things in different file groups is relatively rare and unusual these days with big pools of shared storage. Ozan asks, Hi Brent, regarding MaxDop in a 16 CPU VM environment, I get different results or different faster results with different settings for MaxDop. What problems could I face or when I stay with either 16 or 0? Go to brentozar.com slash go slash cxpacket. brentozar.com slash go slash cxpacket. And I explain how to set MaxDop there. Next up, Bobby Table says, you mentioned that while you haven't done them recently, you've heard of potential issues when doing an in-place upgrade for SQL Server. What issues have you seen reported? 
oh my God, it's, it, I have lived through these and this is why I don't do them anymore. And it's kind of like saying, hey, uh, you haven't, you say you don't like running with scissors because you used to have problems with that. What recent issues have you heard about running with scissors? Dude, running with scissors has been exactly the same problem that it's been for the last 20 years or 50 years or however long scissors have been around. When you do an in-place upgrade, you don't have great rollback strategies. You don't have an easy way to roll back unless you take a snapshot backup of the entire server. And even if you do, what happens when you do the in-place upgrade and something goes wrong, you're just going to roll the whole server back to that previous point in time. How do you do troubleshooting or research on how you're going to do it right the next time? What are you just going to guess that maybe it's going to be better next time? When I'm going to do upgrades, I want the minimal amount of downtime possible and I want to be able to test it first. So that's why you just go build a brand new SQL Server with the OS version and the Windows version that you want. Next up, Shahab asks, what is the top batch request per second sustained that you've seen at your clients and how many DBAs did they have? Around about 200,000 is the, the most recent big one that I was working with. That one had a team of four DBAs that were just focused on performance and nothing else. Then they had a separate set of DBAs who were focused on backup and recovery, you know, patching, keeping the lights on. Ingar asks, do you have a recommended naming convention for SQL Server job schedule names? Indeed I do. I like to prefix the names. For some reason it didn't take the button click. There it goes. I like to uh, prefix the names with which team is involved. If it's the DBA team's job, put DBA at the beginning. If it's the BI team's job, put BI at the beginning. So that way when the job uh, fails, you know quickly which team you need to contact to go troubleshoot it. Because it's not the DBA's fault to troubleshoot every agent job when you're putting all kinds of application logic inside those agent jobs. And we'll do one more. Nomzamo asks, how do you know if the SQL engine has inlined your user function or not? It's a really tricky question. The sarcastic answer, and I do love sarcastic answers, the sarcastic answer would be that you look at the execution plan. If you see the function inside the execution plan where it says table valued function or scalar function, then you can tell that SQL Server did not inline that function. If you don't see the name of the function inside the execution plan, and you see the contents of what the function was doing directly inlined into the execution plan, then you know that that work was inlined. I don't think that I've seen a way that you could just like query a DMV. There is a, an is inlineable uh, column in like sys functions or something like that, but it only means that SQL Server could inline your function doesn't mean that it actually did because whether or not it does depends on how you call that function which could change on a query by query basis well there you go there's a bunch of answers over there for y'all should keep you busy uh, let you get back to work with some intelligence there uh, today i will be driving around the telluride valley we're going to uh, go drive around go see a couple of the waterfalls uh, drove the Jaguar here from Las Vegas. It's about a 600 mile uh, drive from Vegas to Telluride. It's a really pretty drive, all going through Utah, Arizona, canyons, just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and so we'll uh, be doing some driving around today. Hope y'all had fun and I will see y'all at the next office hours. Adios.